Uh, I wondered if you had any comment on the recent allegations by Canadian Prime Minister Trudeau mm -hmm. that agents of India, the government of India, are linked to the shooting, the fatal shooting of a Canadian Sikh activist. Uh, yes, I do have a comment. Okay. Uh, and, uh, Can you share them with uh, us? Sure. No, I, I'll share with you uh, very, very frankly uh, what we uh, what we told the Canadians. Uh, one, we told the Canadians that uh, this is not the government of India's policy. Two, we told the Canadians, saying that look, if you have something specific, if you have something relevant, you know, let us know. We are open to looking at it. So, but to you know, to understand the context of it. Uh, in a way, you know, because the picture is not complete without the context in a way. You also have to appreciate, Ken, that uh, in the last uh, uh, few years, uh, Canada actually has seen a lot of organized crime, uh, you know, relating to, you know, the secessionist uh, uh, forces, organized crime, violence, extremism. They're all very, very deeply mixed up. So, in fact, we have been, you know, talking about specifics and information. We have actually been badgering the Canadians. Uh, we have given them a lot of uh, information about uh, organized crime leadership, which operates out of Canada. Uh, uh, and there are uh, a large number of extradition requests. Uh, there are terrorist leaders uh, who have been identified. Uh, so, uh, do understand that there is an environment out there. So that is important in a way to, uh, to factor in. If you have to understand uh, what, what is uh, uh, going on out there. And our concern is that, uh, you know, it's, it's really been very permissive uh, because of uh, political reasons. Uh, so we have a situation where actually our uh, diplomats are threatened. Uh, our consulates have been attacked, uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, and often comments are made about uh, you know, there's interference in our uh, politics, uh, uh, and uh, you know, a lot of this is often justified uh, as saying, well, that's how democracies work. But if there are specific pieces of evidence that they provide, the government of India will cooperate. With them in terms of I mean, look, if, if somebody gives me something specific, uh, it doesn't have to be restricted to Canada. Uh, but if there's any incident which, uh, you know, is an issue, uh, uh, and somebody gives me something specific as a government, I would look at it. Of course, I would look at it. Okay, let me open it up to the floor for questions both here and for those uh, online. Uh, if you could state your name and affiliation uh, when asked, uh, that would be great. Okay, first, the individual in the back there. Hello, uh, my name is Daniel Block. Uh, I am an editor at Foreign Affairs. Um, I actually want to follow up with something you said at an India Today um, event a while ago. You were asked about uh, India's downgrading in Freedom House and VDEM and other democracy scores. And the journalist asked you, quote, how do you see this play itself out in terms of how India is being perceived by the world and these new reports? In your response, you said, quote, it is hypocrisy. I thought you were supposed to ask me a question. I am asking yeah. you a question. Okay. It is hypocrisy. We have a self-appointed custodians of the world who find it difficult to stomach that someone in India is not looking for their approval, is not willing to play the game they want to play. Um, that doesn't actually answer the journalist's question. So I want to ask you again, are you concerned that perceived democratic backsliding in India is going to undermine its efforts to become a rising power in the world. And by the way, let me just add, this meeting is on the record, so both questions No, I, I think it answers the question, if you would be objective enough to understand it. Uh, I think it says very clearly that uh, the people who are writing these reports have a strong bias, often they distort facts, uh, they, there are, you know, many of these reports are actually riddled with inaccuracies. So I put it to you, there's an ideological agenda out there. I don't know why that's hard to understand. Yes. If you can. 
Thank you so much for the conversation. It's been very helpful. Uh, if you can give I us your name and affiliate. Oh, right. My name is Aditi. I work for CNN. Uh, my question is just in continuation to the Canada uh, a topic that you addressed. Uh, what would be your response to the latest reports that have come in where uh, it is said that intelligence was shared amongst the five eyes about uh, the assassination is what they're calling it. And the other thing is uh, apparently the FBI uh, has told uh, US uh, Sikh leaders that there are credible threats to them. So just wanted your reaction to that. I'm not part of the five eyes. I'm certainly not part of the FBI. So I think you're asking the wrong person. Hey, we have a question online. We'll take our next question from Sharon Tahir Kelly. Ah, okay. Hello, um, on mute. You may go ahead. Yes. Um, I'm, good afternoon, Mr. Minister. It's good to see you even virtually. Right. And. Uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to um, that you are uh, here at, at CFR. My question is, uh, looking forward, what would you say are the three top priorities for U.S.-India relations and globally if those are different? Thank you. Uh, first of all, Shireen, it's good to talk to you. Uh, I must tell the rest of the audience that uh, we, uh, Shireen used to work in the State Department and the White House. And when I was in the US in the 1980s, the Reagan administration, uh, she was a person with whom uh, we worked very closely. And a lot of what uh, we are today uh, taking as a given actually started uh, at that time. Uh, the answer, uh, you know, I, I do think today the India-US relationship has to focus very, very strongly on technology. Uh, and I say that because uh, in many ways, uh, you know, the balance of power in the world has always been a function of the balance of technology. But it is even more intense today. And the impact of technology on our everyday lives is very sweeping. Now, uh, why, is, why does this then become a bilateral issue between us? Uh, because I think when we each look out at the world and uh, assess who are the technology partners, uh, where can we bring value and where can we get value, uh, I think does we, we tend, India and the U.S., to gravitate uh, towards each other. Uh, let, me, let me give you a very practical example. Uh, you have the CHIPS Act, you have the IRA, uh, now, what they would do is really uh, to, uh, they've already actually, uh, in a way, uh, uh, accelerated investments uh, in, in uh, a certain set of tech uh, domains. Uh, but uh, if one were to scale this up at a global level and look for other centers of production and also look to see where uh, the the uh, the HR is to support uh, an expansion of this business. Uh, I would suggest to you actually India is a very very important partner for the United States. Uh, you will we will have like this you know other conversations. It could be on uh, you know critical minerals. Uh, it could be on maritime security. Uh, but the fact is you know in a way, uh, Shireen, I come back to the answer I gave Ken which is the United States today needs partners uh, in order to secure its interests more effectively. There are a finite number of partners out there. Uh, and uh, those potential partners or actual partners in the United States, if this is to work, have to reach some kind of understanding. Now, when we look from the Indian perspective of the world, and again, at the big, you know, at the top league, you can say, there are an even more finite list of countries who would be your partners. Uh, and so uh, often when, if I have to make choices, uh, to me, United States is really uh, an optimal choice. So there is today a very compelling need for India and the United States uh, to work together. And uh, I, I think to me, most of all, uh, that is focused uh, on, on technology. 
a, a, a big part of it, I would say, uh, would also uh, be a spillover into defense uh, and security. A third part of it would actually be politics. You know, I've spoken about the North-South divide. Uh, the fact is, uh, today, uh, you know, the global South uh, is very distrustful uh, of, of the global North, the developed countries. Uh, they've had a very hard time in COVID. So it's useful for the U.S. to have uh, partners who frankly think well of the U.S. and speak well of the U.S. Uh, often behind your back. Yes. Son? Hi, Naima Raza from New York Magazine. Um, I just wanted to follow up, Minister, with a quick clarification. You're saying you have no evidence. This is related to the Canadian story, which I'm sure you're sick of speaking about. Um, have the Canadians, there, there's been reporting that there have been progressive visits from the Canadians to India, including in August. You're saying that you've never familiarized yourself with the documents that were, or no documents have been provided to you by the Canadians that purport to show evidence that Indian officials in Canada were, affair, were aware of this, uh, of this attack. Uh, you have not seen let, these, let, let these intercepted. That. Uh, yeah. let, are you saying the Canadians gave us documents? I'm asking you if the Canadians gave you the intercepted documents. No, look, I, the Indian I, have, diplomatic communications. I have said that if somebody uh, gives us specific or relevant information, we're prepared to look at it. So you have not received those intercepted communications from if the If I Canadian. had, would I not be looking at it? I don't, I'm asking you for a yes or no. I, I, th I think I, he's I suppose, given okay. this answer. And then the other question I was going to ask no, you. No, no, I'm not question. answering a second question. Oh. One question, sorry. Yes, Bob. Thank you. Um, Bob Hormaz, former government official and no. former sure. colleague of uh, Ken's. Um, thank you very much for a very thoughtful presentation. I would be very interested in your thoughts on what the Chinese are doing or planning to do in the Indian Ocean. If you look at the Indian Ocean, the Chinese used to call it the string of pearls. Or we wouldn't necessarily use the same term. It's a very mm -hmm. benign one. but. If you look at what's going on, there's a base in Djibouti. There's certainly a lot more activity in Sri Lanka. There's a lot of activity in Gwadar. There's a lot more Chinese activity in Myanmar. And then, of course, in the Pacific Islands that go through the Straits or around the Straits of Malacca. Mm -hmm. So um, the question I have is, what do you see the Chinese motive as being in, in this? Is it purely commercial? Is it establishing commercial relations, but also establishing the basis for a greater degree of security presence? And if the latter, uh, what do you recommend or think the Quad ought to do, if anything, to be sure that the power or the balance of power does not shift in a way that's adverse to India or the United States? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, uh, let me first say that pearls look benign unless you ask the oysters. Uh, so they may have a slightly different may not perspective. Be happy with the pearls, uh, but uh, the the point is uh, uh, yes. Uh, if one were to look at the last 20, 25 years, uh, there's been a steady. Uh, steady uh, increase uh, in the Chinese uh, naval uh, presence and activity in the Indian Ocean. But there's been a very sharp increase in the size of the Chinese Navy. So uh, when you have uh, a very much bigger Navy, uh, I mean, that Navy is going to be uh, obviously uh, visible in terms of its deployment uh, somewhere. Uh, and uh, uh, I guess when you come out of the east coast of China, you either go into the Pacific uh, or you, you know, uh, turn uh, westwards and come into the Indian Ocean. Now, in our own case, uh, you know, we have seen, uh, uh, you know, uh, Chinese uh, port activity, uh, port building. Uh, you mentioned Gwadar. There's a port called Hambantota in, um, in Sri Lanka. There are a few others. Now, uh, in many cases, uh, I would say, looking back, uh, maybe 
uh, the governments of the day, the policy makers of the day, uh, perhaps uh, uh, underestimated uh, the the importance of uh, of this and and uh, what how these ports could uh, work in future. Uh, uh, it it uh, you know each one is a little unique in a way, uh, and uh, uh, certainly uh, you know we we uh, obviously uh, uh, do watch you know many of them very carefully for any security implications uh, that they have for us. So from uh, an Indian point of view, uh, I would say it's very reasonable for us to uh, try and you know to not try and prepare, to actually prepare uh, for, uh, for a far, far uh, greater uh, Chinese presence than we have seen before. Now, uh, when I say that, I also make one other point, which is, it's not, you know, uh, maritime concerns are not necessarily today between two countries. There are maritime issues there for countries to deal with. I mean, if you look at maritime threats, a lot of, you know, threats of uh, piracy, of uh, smuggling, of terrorism. Uh, if, if there is no, uh, uh, no authority, no monitoring, uh, no force out there to, to actually um, uh, enforce uh, uh, the rule of the law, uh, it's a problem. Uh, and uh, the fact is, again, I'm in a sense, coming back to that theme, uh, if one looks at what historically used to be the American presence in the Indian Ocean, it is much less so today. Uh, so uh, what it has done is it has left gaps. And it has left gaps at a time when threats have actually increased because uh, the, the, uh, the, the problem forces, in a way, the problem people, actually are much more technologically adept uh, than they were before. So, uh, you know, I don't really see the Quad uh, necessarily as a grouping which is meant, you know, it's, it's to me a bit old-fashioned uh, to make it point towards another country. Uh, I think there are global commons there to be safeguarded. Uh, I think there are concerns out there which are better addressed if the Quad countries work together. Uh, in fact, uh, I would... I would uh, even give you the example of something like uh, HADR. Uh, you know, when we had in 2004 the Boxing Day tsunami, uh, the biggest naval presence and a very speedy naval presence at that time was from the United States. Now, I'm not sure if, God forbid, something happens today that we're going to see a repetition of that. Uh, so, uh, times have changed, force levels have changed, capabilities have changed, uh, and certainly in those that have gone up, China is one of them, but it's, you know, there are countries with which we work and there are countries with which we don't or we work less. And I think you can, you can see that. Let's go to the next question online. We'll take our next question from Akshaya Kumar. Uh, hello, um, Minister Jay Shankar. Thank you for um, your time here with me. I'm Akshaya Kumar with Human Rights Watch. And I had a question about Manipur in particular. Um, your, we want to know what your government is doing to address the divisive politics that's leading to attacks on minorities there. You have said that the comments from 18 independent UN experts who expressed concerns about Manipur were presumptive and misleading. Uh, however, it took three months before Prime Minister Modi spoke out on the issue. So instead of acknowledging that entire communities have been devastated, isn't it wrong that local officials, including the Home Minister and the Chief Minister of Manipur, are blaming the violence on infiltrators? Uh, what is the way the center will take forward this issue at this time? Uh, so you're giving me a question or an answer or both? Uh, so the, uh, the, the question is, uh, UN experts well, have question. been dismissed by you as being presumptive uh, and not providing the correct information about Manipur. But isn't it the case 
that uh, local officials have not responded adequately. And in fact, even the prime minister took three months before speaking out on the rape and trading of women uh, in okay. Manipur. So, so let me, if you ask me, uh, uh, the, I think the comment which I mean, wasn't made by me personally, but was I think made by a spokesperson, if I understand it right. Uh, was that comment correct? My answer to you would be yes. Uh, if you ask me, uh, you know, what is happening today in Manipur, I think one, uh, you know, one part of the problem in Manipur has been the destabilizing impact uh, of, uh, 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 of uh, migrants who have come. That's one aspect of it. Uh, but there are also tensions which uh, obviously have a long history which uh, precede that. Uh, and uh, today, I think the effort is on the part of the state government and the union government uh, to find a way by which, uh, you know, a sense of normalcy returns, that arms which were seized during that period are recovered, uh, that there is an adequate law and order uh, uh, enforcement out there uh, so that incidents of violence uh, don't happen. Hey, question. Uh, yes. to see you, Mr. Minister. Uh, Ramakrishna from the Wood Solutionographic Institution. Congratulations on a very successful G20 and uh, what you had done in taking that to the entire country is quite remarkable, something that has never been done before. Uh, the question is, given the leadership role that you have played as part of G20, as part of the Global South, one of the big challenges facing the world now is climate change. Mm -hmm. And the the divide that you spoke of eloquently is well taken. What is India's role in bridging that? And what further, I mean, you talked about the International Solar Alliance, et cetera, but what further things can India do to bring the South and North together? Thank you. Well, uh, you know, uh, we have uh, done the New Delhi G20 summit. Uh, we are heading towards the COP28 uh, at the end of November, early December. Uh, and uh, uh, clearly this issue has has become even more topical though though it's one something which is always very very high uh, in the in everybody's uh, priority uh, look the uh, i think the bottom line problem today uh, is the fact that there's a very visible paucity of resources and terms on which resources are available so it's it's part of it is access to finance and, you know, the terms of access as well for green development to happen. So one of the themes which the G20 focused on was something called the Green Development Pact. Now, uh, again, uh, here we are talking about uh, further development, which is more environment climate friendly. Uh, but uh, sustainability itself is under threat. I mean, you've seen the UN report on the uh, SDG, the Midway uh, status report on the SDG. Uh, the fact is COVID has taken a tremendous toll uh, on the ability of uh, uh, the developing world to progress uh, on, on the SDG uh, pathway. Uh, so uh, I would say today the uh, one of the key issues is how do we generate the resources really to deal with uh, green technology, uh, green development? Because uh, you, with each passing year, the technology options are growing. Uh, the, you know, there's there a lot of things are today viable, which they were not even two, three, five years ago. So in the past, we often had a problem that we, you know, we didn't have a solution. Today we have a solution. The issue is to scale it up, to to spread it out, to make it affordable. To make and only if it is affordable is it really accessible. So uh, the you know the SDG realization, the Green Development Pact, the reform of international financial institutions. These are all today deeply interconnected. We are not going to get a fix on one without a solution. Uh, on the other. So a large part of our presidency is actually focused on, on taking uh, that forward. 
Uh, and there are, I mean, we still have two months left of our G20 presidency. I think uh, there is a possibility that, uh, you know, uh, there could be uh, some progress on uh, some of these issues. But uh, it is, it is and, and again, you know, uh, uh, if, if one were to list really the big risks, uh, we, we've seen what a pandemic can do, we've seen what conflicts can do. Uh, do, do think about it, how often big climate events are occurring and what are the uh, globally economic disruptive implications of those uh, climate events. I mean, today, uh, when we look at supply chain, you know, you talk about resilient and reliable supply chains. I mean, supply chains have to plan for climate events as well. I, I think uh, if, you know, given, uh, or, you know, there's still a high degree of over-concentration uh, of uh, economic production in the world today. So there are some regions uh, which actually, in a way, because they are so central to the global economy, they also represent risks. And part of those risks also emanate from climate. 